Hello and welcome. Sorry for the little pause. I couldn't un get myself unmuted. And welcome uh, to today's uh, discussion on democracy endangered the case of Brazil. It's a welcome from me, Michael Scott in the UK, and from my joint convener, Sanford J. Ungar in Washington, DC, to this, the 28th jointly promoted event between the Future of the Humanities Project and the Free Speech Project. The latter is sponsored by Georgetown University and the former by Georgetown's Humanities Initi Initiative in association with Campion Hall Oxford and the Las Casas Institute for Social Justice, Blackfriars Hall, Oxford. Together, the two projects consider issues concerning human dignity, rights, cultures, histories, traditions, and freedoms in a wide spectrum of educational activity, policy, expression, and aspiration. In a moment, I'll hand over to Sandy, who is the director of the Free Speech Project. He will introduce today's distinguished guests and moderate the ensuing discussion before I return to chair the question and answer session towards the end of the event. From the start, you can type in questions to the panel by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please use the Q&A button and not the chat one. These questions will come to me during the session and I will try and put them in some kind of coherent uh, order for the panel to consider. We urge you to ask questions as and when they occur to you so that we don't have a backlog right at the end. So I hope you enjoy today's discussion. I'm looking forward to it greatly. Over to you, Sandy. Thank you very much, Mike, and welcome to everybody on our new Wednesday schedule for these programs during the spring semester. And uh, we're delighted to have an international group with us today from Brazil, from Rio, actually. We have Ana Ionova, who was originally from uh, Bulgaria, but has been reporting in Brazil for some time now, I think about six years, if I'm not mistaken, Ana. And, uh, and also Nick Barnes. They are both with us from uh, Rio. Ana, as I said, has worked in Brazil for some time. She reports on many current issues for an international collection of people, including Reuters, the BBC, The Guardian, The New York Times, and Foreign Policy Magazine. Nick Barnes is in Rio, where he is uh, doing research in the favelas for the last several years, and that is uh, an important uh, factor in the, the, the discontent in the favelas, favelas of Brazil have always been a, a factor that people have to contend with. Nick is a lecturer in the School of International Relations at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland and is also affiliated with Brown University's Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. In addition, um, from Oxford, Andres de Souza Santos, who is a lecturer and senior fellow at the Latin American Center of St. Anthony's College at Oxford. And with us also today is Ishan Tarur, a columnist on the foreign desk of the Washington Post who has been concerned with issues of democracy and related matters in, in the world at large and writing about them over a considerable period of time. His column comes out late at night, and I always think that's an advantage it has for, for people. Uh, Anna, I'd like to go to you first to ask you briefly to summarize what actually happened early this month, early February in uh, Brasilia and whether it was echoed in other parts of the country as well. Yes, um, thank you for having me and great to, to take part of this discussion. Uh, so yes, what, what happened in January actually, early January was um, this uh, insurrection very much uh, kind of mirroring what, what happened in the US uh, two years earlier um, with, in which supporters of uh, Jair Bolsonaro, the former president who lost October's election, uh, stormed the three uh, buildings, the seats of power. Um, and it was, it was something that shocked the country. 
uh, and all of us reporting that have spent months and months reporting not only on the election, but also on the presidency, Bolsonaro's pres presidency, which was, of course, marked by um, a lot of attacks on the institutions, uh, putting them, kind of framing them as, as this enemy, um, his enemy and an enemy of the people, especially the Supreme Court. Um, and, you know, obviously there were statements and um, his supporters had been kind of talking about this uh, sentiment that they were not going to accept a, def a defeat. Um, and they had been camping out in front of uh, military headquarters for weeks and weeks and weeks before this happened. Um, but it, it did shock um, the country and, uh, you know, the international community as well, um, because it was just such a, an extreme kind of show of violence and, and a rejection on, um, you know, democracy as, as it functions in Brazil. Um, and obviously there are huge repercussions, um, you know, there are still questions over the financial, logistical and kind of uh, ideological um actors who inspired this who facilitated these attacks um and you know it poses a lot of questions about the future of of democracy and, and the version of democracy that um almost half of the population that voted for bolsonaro has thanks very much um nick you've been in brazil for some time as well were you surprised by what happened uh, early this month and do you have additional perspectives, and 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 I would like everybody who has uh, been following this to comment eventually on the degree to which it was modeled on what happened in Washington two years ago. Nick, yeah, thank you for having me in this discussion. Um, so I I hadn't arrived yet to Brazil this time. I've been going back and forth for about the last decade. Um, but I arrived maybe 10 days after. And for sure, the, the insurrection on January 8th surprised a lot of us and saddened uh, a great many of the Brazilians that I know. Um, I think uh, in, in many ways, it, it absolutely resembled the January 6th uh, at attacks on the US Congress in sort of obvious ways. Um, you know, the, the, the claims that the election had been stolen, um, the, the violence that the, the insurrectionists used against police to enter into the buildings, the, the vandalism that happened. But, you know, at the time, the, the, the Congress and the president were not in those buildings or operating. So this is a, quite a bit different than what happened in, in Washington when if, you know, if things had happened slightly different or, you know, they had managed to get to Vice President Pence or some of the other people in Congress, we would have had a, a real constitutional Congress. The election in Brazil had already been certified. Uh, this was a demand by the protesters, um, a great many of them, that the military intervene, that, um, that they weren't going to accept the results of the election. So I think very similar in, in many ways, but there were a couple of important uh, uh, differences. Uh, and Andresa, uh, you have, no doubt a considerable knowledge of Brazilian history and the the history of military coups and, and instability in the country. Uh, how much of that is, how much of that worry, that, that anxiety about Brazil's democracy is revi revived on this occasion? Please remember, to, yeah. Sorry? No, I want to make sure you unmuted yourself. Yeah. Um, thank you for, for the panel and the question. Um, mixed feelings, I think, because the, the army nowadays, it is, it, there was a lot of doubts amongst Brazilians and, and scholars that study Brazil, whether that would be like an organized military coup or not. And we didn't see it happening. And I, and I think institutions in Brazil um, actually showed some strength in, in the way that um, they have punished um, a lot of the people that were there, that they were in prison, the way that the army didn't um, participate on that, even though people were camping in front of the headquarters for uh, months. Of course, then the police uh, 
you know, didn't intervene, perhaps facilitated the occupation of the building. So there were some questions about, especially police force and the military, um, what they could have done to prevent this and what did they do to actually enhance the, this vandalism that happened in Brazil. But this is still far from them, you know, building up on a, on a coup, on, on a military coup. So, um, so I think it is, it is a, a different time than, than, you know, the 1960s in Brazil and Latin America when there was a wave of military coup in the region. Um, in that sense, I, I think Lula um, actually built up a momentum um, to, to create some synergies. I think it shocked a lot of people in Brazil. And, uh, and I think he brought together, which is quite um, unique, a lot of the governors, uh, almost all governors from all states, they intervened in the government of Brasilia, which is actually my hometown. So for me, it was very sad to see everything that was going on. And to, to make a long story short, um, I think there is, uh, we can think of a threat to democracy in Brazil, but I think this, and we can talk about this later, has to do with fake news, it has to do with disinformation, it has to do with all these bubbles um, that are difficult to come together in the country now. But I don't think necessarily this would come from an institu institutionalized coup. Thanks. Ishan, can you put this preliminarily into an international context for us? Is this, uh, do you do you see a broader trend than uh, we're all aware of, or are we making too much of it? Uh, and I, I think the fact that it happened almost exactly two years after the incident, the, the insurrection at the Capitol, caused people to draw a link immediately. I mean, I, I certainly uh, see it in, in, in I, I think it's important to situate this in a broader context. Obviously, there is so much that is unique to the Brazilian uh, political scene. There's there is a whole history and set of contexts that that make the events there. Uh, you know, it, it, there are ways in which parallels can obscure, but absolutely uh, January 6th shadows January 8th. And I think uh, it would be foolish of Americans to underplay that. I think there's, there's beyond just the fact that there are parallels, there is a certain kind of American responsibility um, uh, over the situation. And that's partially because of the very pronounced links between uh, Bolson, the element figures within the Bolsonaro camp and the Trump camp. Uh, there's of course also a kind of even perhaps more important discursive uh, connection between the United States and Brazil, between the far right in the United States and Brazil, that um, has played into the moment we live in right now. Uh, I think I think we can obviously parse a lot of that, but but that that underlines the anger and the fanaticism to a certain extent that we saw uh, influencing events uh, in the last weeks, uh, well at least before Lula uh, it was inaugurated and afterwards. Uh, and you know I I am. Um, I was in Davos a couple of weeks after January 8th, and I talked to some members of Lula's administration about their views uh, of, uh, of what happened. And what was interesting is they, they didn't really want to be pulled into making connections to January 6th, but they did emphasize how important it was this time around that you had a Biden administration that so swiftly wheeled around in defense of Brazilian democracy uh, that you had a Congress, especially Democrats in Congress, who had legislative tools in place to try to punish Brazil in case of uh, an intervention that undermined Brazilian democracy. You had American generals deeply aware of how important it was to certain Brazilian generals to maintain the security links and cooperation they had. And so you had a, a Washington, which in the past, of course, uh, has done quite a lot to, to interrupt democracies in Latin America and to enable military interventions, now really primed for the situation. And um, I, I was quite surprised by how, how, how much they stressed uh, the significance of that uh, rhetorical solidarity because they felt that solidarity had deeply meaningful and practical uh, consequences as, as well. You, you mentioned the Latin American connection. I think we should pause for a moment to draw on that there's some other places in Latin America at the moment undergoing very dramatic issues 
relating to the governance of the countries, I think first of Peru, where which is, uh, as I understand it, in a really chaotic state at the moment where a government has been severely weakened, an elected government, and nothing really has taken its place. Uh, and uh, does anyone uh, on the panel, especially perhaps the, the people based in, in Brazil, uh, I mean, Peru is a very different place in many respects, and it's, it's difficult to generalize, but Anna and, and Nick, do you have any, uh, any thoughts about Peru? Um, Nicaragua is in a very interesting, interesting state at the moment. The people who took over in the name of democracy and popular revolt some years ago have become tyrants and dictators in, in Nicaragua. Um, and I think there's some other countries. Uh, Argentina is almost always in a financial crisis and seems to be again. What do, what do you think about that? Anna? Um, yeah, so I do think it's important to kind of look at the regional context in terms of, you know, what is the impact of um, the economic turmoil in the region that many of these these countries, you know, the, the protests, including um, in uh, across the continent, obviously in, in Chile is a good example a few years ago. Um, but, you know, there's there's a thread of people feeling like their grievances are not being um, addressed through um, the model of democracy that is um, that is in place in their countries. Um, I do think Brazil is a slightly different example because what we see is kind of this um, this thread of you know taking these grievances, taking taking these economic frustrations, the, the social inequality, um, the problems, you know, the frustration with corruption, and then seeing that uh, radicalized and um, kind of fueled with misinformation and fake news. So I do think Brazil is slightly different, um, you know, in terms of what's happening and the threat to democracy here versus what we're seeing in Peru, where. You know, obviously, there there's a frustration with um, with kind of the model of democracy and people feeling like it's not serving them. Um, so I I do think it's important to to consider you know what does that say about the state of democracy across Latin America and globally? Uh, if so so many people are not are not seeing themselves represented in the political system, they're not seeing a kind of their um, their lives improved by kind of the, the people that they elect in office, right? Um, but I do think in, in Brazil, the challenge in the years ahead um, will definitely revolve around rooting out this alternative parallel reality that exists. Because um, no matter what policies um, Lula's government will, will put in place or the next government will put, put in place, um, there is kind of a this broader uh, universe of, of disinformation that keeps um, kind of pushing forward a different reality that, that you can't, that continues to radicalize people. So I, I don't think, you know, you can speak about a functioning democracy in a place where, you know, the access and the acceptance of information is so, is so fragmented. Andresa, your center at Oxford, uh studies all of Latin America. So I wonder what you what you might have to add here. Actually, I think Anna, Anna's intervention is great. I think there is a substantial difference between, um, I think the case of Peru and um, could be discussed perhaps in relation to some of the events we saw in Chile in the past, like which was like, a, like this discontent. Um, with um, you know what democracy delivers, while what we saw in Brazil is uh, heavily polarized and and disputed realities that were um, happening. And I see Nick um, has his hand up, so I'll hand it to him. <laughs> Go ahead, Nick. Sorry, I wasn't I wasn't sure if I should use the hand function. That's or not. just fine. Yes, you uh, okay. hand or hand or voice. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I very much agree with what uh, Anna and Andresa were saying. I think, um, you know, putting my political scientist hat on for the moment, I, it's, it's well documented that the quality and quantity of democracy around the globe over the last few years has, has gone down for the first time 
you know, since the 1970s and 1980s. So I think that a lot of what's happening in various places in Latin America, throughout uh, Europe, Africa, and Asia as well, is all sort of part of, uh, you know, some sort of wave that's occurring. We don't know exactly what's causing that, but for sure, a lot of um, disillusionment with existing democratic institutions is one of them. I think the comparison, too close a comparison between Brazil and some of the other cases in, in Latin America, as Andresa said, is, is probably not warranted. But I think the polarization is there for sure. In Peru, you see that, the left, right, the, the right, which was in charge of the Congress, was trying to impeach the sitting president, who then attempted to dissolve Congress, and this sort of devolved into uh, 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 exceptional circumstances. I think the closest comparison in Brazil would be, you know, what happened to former President Dilma Rousseffi, or the the struggle that I think Lula is going to face with a Congress that is uh, uh, with a lot of politicians who are much more in the Bolsonaro camp. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of a lot of conflict that's going to be occurring in Brazil. Lula has a, a relatively weak mandate. Um, you know, he's got a lot of executive powers that he can use, but I think he's going to really struggle to govern against uh, a, a, a bunch of right wing politicians and parties that are strong. I think social media here is is maybe the bigger or one of the biggest stories. And I think the manner in which democracies, not just Brazil or the United States, but around the globe, try to deal with disinformation is 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 really one of the bigger stories here. And we can talk about you know, Alexandre de Moraes and, and his efforts as, as a minister of the Supreme Court in Brazil to, you know, ban some of these accounts, to, to, to use uh, the powers of the ju judiciary, which are much greater in Brazil than in the United States, for instance, to go after uh, some of those people and some of those parties. Um, so I think there is, that is a huge difference, I think, with the United States, where it seems like the judiciary has largely stayed away from mandating, uh, you know, social media uh, ban these people, and that's sort of allowed them to do it on their own if and when they do it. And I mean, I think this is the bigger story here, is how you respond to, to that threat to democracy. Um, do you go after these individuals immediately? with all the powers of the judiciary, or do you have some sort of process like the, the January 6th Congressional House Committee that tries to bring a lot of this information and tries to create a sort of consensus about what exactly was going on? And I'd be very interested to hear what other what other people on the panel thought about, the, about that. Right, and we'll come back to uh, the member of the Supreme Court, to Marais, who took this extraordinary role in a moment. But I wanna to turn to Ishan again to uh, ask him if if comparisons occur uh, around the world, not just in Latin America, but around the world, where social media have played such a role in stoking up uh, discontent, and and whether there's some other comparisons you would draw, Ishan. I mean, there are so many at this point. We live in an age where democracy and social media are are fundamentally intertwined, and 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 our experience of democracy is fundamentally uh, sort of conditioned by social media now. Uh, just in the next couple of weeks, we're seeing, we're entering the, the end stages of a Nigerian election campaign that is flooded and defined by so much misinformation through WhatsApp, TikTok, and so on, um, to the point that you know people are commenting there that uh, voters are just completely desensitized to any information they're receiving. They don't take anything seriously. And that, that, that kind of cynicism, this kind of postmodern cynicism that social media is putting certain people in and putting vote ordinary voters in is a is a curious and slightly alarming phenomenon. Uh, you had you saw in the Philippines last year um, the the return to power of the Marcos family, this once dictatorial uh, family, who uh, through social media and through a whole cast of influencers who supported them on social media, uh, essentially whitewashed their family's legacy in the seventies and eighties. And you know the the list go it, 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 the, you know there's so many examples of this sort of stuff, um, in an age where there are lots of elections, lots of people are voting around the world, uh, the 
the issues that they're voting over, the things that are influencing political parties, the things that are influencing political conversations uh, are, are much murkier are much more, and are much more defined by, uh, are much more vulnerable to uh, a profound level of misinformation that we see on social media. Some of that is very directed, some of that isn't. Uh, and, uh, and it's something we have to parse through. I think um, the United States, of course, is, 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 is locked within its own kind of polarized uh, uh, and, and overheated uh, political conversation, but, but it is curious to see how Brazil is tackling some of these issues. Uh, while the United States is perhaps much more meeker because of its its own kind of First Amendment fundamentalism. Actually, thanks for bringing up the case of Nigeria, which is a very important one, one of the most significant and uh, prosperous in some ways countries in Africa, uh, where it was thought two elections ago that they had overcome some of the differences of the past and had some of the internal strife of the past, especially Christian, Muslim conflicts, et cetera, and had headed down a new road. And now that people seem much more pessimistic about what's happening in Nigeria. And so that it sort of raises for me, I, I was actually an observer of that election two elections ago in Nigeria, and I shared the exuberance and the optimism we all felt about watching that election at the time. Um, the, the, the sort of here we go again sense of things at the moment around the world. And, uh, I, I, I don't know, uh, I don't know where that leads and what, what institutions can intervene and try to help solve that. And I, I if any, if any movements or institutions, and I wonder if anyone else on the panel has thoughts about that, where, where would Brazil turn, for example, if it wants support for reestablishing stability. Can it can it count exclusively on the United States or Latin American institutions, or does it where where, where does it turn? Andresa, do you have some thoughts about that? Um, I don't think the problem lies on institutions that don't deliver necessarily. In the case of Brazil, um, the Supreme Court has acted quite strongly, and, and we can mention some other institutions in Brazil. And public service in Brazil has improved um, in the past few years dramatically, inclusive during Lula's administration. So, although there was a lot of intimidation on public servants during Bolsonaro's administration, um, it is still a very solid block of of a, a new generation of public servants that are uh, very committed. The, the issue of polarization and misinformation, I need, uh, I think it needs to be to be addressed. And I, and I, I think this is, a, is an entire new field um, that we are gonna have to deal with the, the owners, like the private owners of some of the social medias. I think there is a lot of discussions already regarding Instagram, Facebook, and WhatsApp, and we can mention Telegram and, and many others on the levels of um, like how like information gets checked, which accounts, uh, accounts get blocked um, and so on. And I think use the social media itself as well to, to deliver information, for example, with, um, to give one example and to finish my participation here with the, on this specific question, I mean, with um, COVID-19 and with um, some other diseases happening in Brazil, now there is a, a great level of disinformation and misinformation about vaccines and what vaccines generate and, and so on. And it's very clear that you cannot do a vaccination campaign as you did in the past, which was, um, you know, basically um, just putting people to vaccinate and making vaccine accessible. Because nowadays the vaccines may be accessible and people still may not go or they may have a, a lot of questions and there is a lot of information about it. So campaigns will need to change um, their format and they will need to, to include also the social media and use like 
um, influencers to, to to deliver information, to have debates, and they they will have to plan a, a very different model of campaign because it's no longer about making it accessible, but to make the information also accessible and the and, and the, the 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 correct information to be access, uh, accessible to people. And we are going to see that in, in many other realms um, in Brazil. Ana, uh, let me actually pause for, for a second and uh, uh, say that if people who are listening and participating from a distance have questions, now would be a good time to use the Q&A button on your screen to raise these questions so that Mike Scott and uh, uh, John McCabe can be sorting those out for the second part of the program. But Anna, what do you, what do you see as the um, immediate agenda in Brazil coming out of this? Lula is not as strong as he was the first time around. Clearly, he's been in, he he he's been held guilty for criminal charges, money, money laundering, etc. In the meantime, and. Uh, Will will he be strong enough, or will he serve out his term? Yeah. So, um, some interesting kind of polling numbers came out actually today or, or last night um, that seem to indicate that you know his approval rating. It's very early on still, um, and obviously he's been kind of fighting fires with uh, um, what happened in January. But essentially, you know, we're seeing that a good chunk of the population is happy with with the way that uh, he's handling things at the moment i think he's already signaled um a focus on kind of economic issues um which are probably going to be kind of the, the most significant um challenge you know in terms of concrete policy that he will have to deal with over the next um four years but um, and also, of course, he's kind of delved uh, right in into the Amazon uh, kind of crisis, especially um, expelling kind of illegal miners from uh, the Yanomamis uh, territory. However, um, even though, you know, we see a good, you know, approval rating this early on, I think, you know, the Brazilian population just remains so deeply polarized and so deeply divided. Um, that, you know, as you mentioned, his track record, even though his charges were thrown out, um, you know, he was freed. And, you know, he's tried to recuperate the, you know, the, the trust of, of many Brazilians. It just, you know, hasn't worked uh, to the extent that perhaps he hoped um, he would be able to, to kind of win back the trust of Brazilians. So there are still deep divides. There's still many people who feel um, you know, who have bought into false claims of fraud during the election, who reject uh, his legitimacy as, as their president. Uh, so this is a challenge which I think goes back to what Andres and, and what Nick mentioned in terms of how do you kind of rebuild the credibility, not just of, of Lula as, as a politician as a president, but of democracy, right? The dem democratic model of, of a system. Yeah. So I do think, and at the core of it, I do think social media and kind of the the spread of of disinformation is at really at the heart of it. Um, and yeah, at one point, you know, it'd be great to to kind of talk about the measures that are being taken in Brazil because I do think, you know, on one hand, it's great to see something being done. On the other hand, I do feel like it's backfired a little bit, uh, especially in kind of in terms of the, the power and the concentration of of action that has been taken by Alexandre de Moraes. Uh, we'll come back to that and also to the Amazon in a moment, but um, Nick, maybe you can tell us what some of the lessons are of your research that you've done in the favelas of, of Rio in recent years. Uh, what do they lead you to conclude or, or hypothesize about the ability to govern Brazil effectively? Uh, big question. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I would say that, I mean, one of the interesting things, having lived in and, and done a lot of work in Rio's favelas for the last 10 years, is that this distinction between, say, democracy and dictatorship within the communities, at least, 
is not quite as easy to see. They'll say, you know, the democracy hasn't brought all of the things to those populations that maybe it brought to, to other populations. They still suffer from a lot of repressive public security attention. So, you know, the ability of police to go in and abuse or use violence within those communities is still extremely high. And especially after Bolsonaro and the election of several governors in the state of Rio, that were more in this sort of uh, tough on crime approach, uh, that's only gotten worse. So I think in, in some ways there's a disjuncture between what's happening at, these, at this like elite level, not to say that it doesn't impact, but that in an everyday sort of circumstance in these communities, they're dealing with you know, uh, a, a dictatorship from the 60s that in some ways never ended because they never mm -hmm. reformed the public security apparatus. Um, and they're still continuing to, to fight and advocate for their, their rights to the criminal justice system, to greater redistribution, to access to public services that you know, many other segments of the population uh, you know, have gotten access to. So I think like, uh, you know, it's a, it's a difficult conversation because I don't want to downplay what's happening in Brasilia or what's happening with presidential politics, but in the favelas, sometimes it feels a little uh, disjointed, uh, a little disconnected from some of those uh, party politics that's happening uh, in, in the central government. Ishan, does Brazil go on to a list of, uh, for some of the reasons that Nick points out onto a list of countries that are, it's questionable whether they're really governable in, in this era, but they're effectively governable. I would certainly defer to my, my colleagues who are much closer to the, to the story than I am uh, to, to, to answer that very uh, weighty question. I think in many ways we've seen Brazilian institutions endure. It's democracy how the line. In some ways you could argue more successfully than what Americans have managed uh, since January 6th uh, and the Biden and the Biden's inauguration. Uh, at the same time, uh, the the depth of polarization, the the uncertainty around um, you know what may come next, uh, especially when you look at sort of questions around certain elements of the security forces, um, those questions will endure. Um, I, I do think it's very interesting to watch, you know what the Lula administration and specifically Alexandre de Moraes uh, does in terms of pushing ahead with his efforts to combat uh, anti-democratic anti uh, conspir conspiratorial misinformation, right? This is, uh, these, are, these are efforts that are interesting, that are theoretically quite important in the defense of democracy. Uh, they are possible in certain countries. You, know, these, you, know, you can do, make, uh, achieve similar things, say, in certain European democracies. You could not take this, these steps in the United States, at least not in the same way. Uh, and I think there'll be very important lessons to draw from that uh, going forward. Let's focus for a moment on Alexander de Moraes and this unusual intervention he, he made. Uh, is he angling to be a future leader of Brazil? And is that is that imaginable, Anna or... Andresa, do you have some thoughts about that? Anna? Well, the last, um, well, I, I, I wouldn't think like um, a minister of the Supreme Court would um, run to become a politician. Like they, in a way, they have a lot more power as Supreme Court ministers. They have a, a, a mandate until um, they are 70 years old, if I'm not mistaken. And you know, the last uh, judge that tried to become a politician was Moro and was very <laughs> clumsy path and still is. Um, and I think there are other strong um, candidates that are actually now ministers of Lula. We can think of Simone Tebet, we can think of uh, Fernanda Daji, we can think of many other ministers now in Lula's administrations that will um, try a seat. I don't think Alexandre de Moura is one of them, but I, I really agree with Anna about 
um, this backfire sometimes in, in, in the Supreme Court when they take such strong actions and then they, they are considered enemies. And, they, and especially when it comes to, to the nature of judiciary, like if you, if you feel like someone has something against you, then they, they can't, you know, judge or cause. So that's what uh, Bolsonaro is trying to do with Alexandre de Moraes, to make it as a personal enemy, to take away the, the legitimacy of Alexandre de Moraes, to judge some cause related to Bolsonaro's administration. So how it, it personifies the fight, the struggle. It's not like the Supreme Court trying to be disinformation, fake news, or, or you know, any crime, but it's like Alexandre de Moraes hunting Bolsonaristas. And that personification um, is, is, of course, bad for, for legal causes because you want justice to be, to be blind, to judge everybody equally on the basis of the Constitution. And then Alexandre de Moraes is... is being personified as this kind of figure of fighting a, a specific target. So, so this is backfiring, although um, it is the Supreme Court doing its job. Um, it, 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 it is difficult. That's why I, I really believe that um, like social media is being so used um, to, to the bad. It can also be used um, in a ways to, to promote um, better access to information. So how we are going to innovate in, in, in this, I think this should be seen, but um, yeah, like I, I think there is a lot to be produced um, to, to counter the misinformation that is and not institutionalized. One, one other issue that I want to come back to before we turn things over to Mike and the questions that have been accumulating is this seemingly the central question of the Amazon and and what has happened there the violence in the amazon the uh, fundamental confrontation there which seems to reflect a huge to to a huge degree the international drama over the environment and and, and climate change um on a how how will will the amazon be at the top of lula's agenda will, do, does the country accept the significance of what's going on there? So throughout his campaign, Lula made it very clear that, you know, he intended to tackle deforestation, that he intended to put Brazil back on uh, the global kind of stage as a leader in kind of the, the fight against climate change. Um, and, you know, right off the bat, he has made some very significant uh, kind of both political and in terms of policy appointments, very important appointments um, in terms of, you know, um, the environmental enforcement agencies, which obviously under Bolsonaro were paralyzed um, and gutted of resources. So um, he has kind of taken steps um, to start, you know, crackdowns on illegal activities in the Amazon right away. Um, so really, you know, there are some positive signs. Also, you know, hugely important was his his um, negotiation of the, um, I guess, to to resume this, uh, you know, Amazon fund, which is really important in the in the combat um, against deforestation here in Brazil. Um, however, I think the key challenge is you know, what do you, once you, you, you know, pluck out, you root out these illegal activities like mining, logging, illegal um, kind of, you know, land grabbing for the purposes of cattle ranching or whatever activity it may be. Once you, you remove those from, you know, the heart of the Amazon, what do you replace it with as an economic model? Um, so I think that's a question that, you know, will take far longer than the four years that he, he has in, in office. Uh, to resolve and you know the you know answering your question whether the country kind of accepts um, the necessity to tackle uh, deforestation and, and climate change uh, most most of the time when you know when I go on a reporting trip in the middle of the Amazon people are concerned with their kind of economic um, you know the, their ability to kind of feed their families or you know uh, see their personal prosperity um, kind of flourish. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of resistance uh, to the fight against um, deforestation. And that's, I think, where, you know, the alternative um, is really important. What do you have to offer these people so they 
you know, it's worthwhile for them to maintain uh, the Amazon, you know, standard. Nick, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, no, that, I mean, I think Anna, Anna said it all very well. Um, I would say that, you know, the Amazon is just, it, it's such an enormous region. It's kind of hard to wrap your head around and to effectively be able to try to govern and control some of this uh, illegal behavior is going to be incredibly difficult. And the amount of resources that will be required to do that are considerable. I mean, Lula is you know, going to have probably a lot of international support for this, and he's going to put resources there. But, you know, a lot of these landowners, corporate interests, illegal mining or timber, um, you know, cattle raising is going to is going to continue. And I, I you know, I, I'm sort of I'm a little pessimistic that Brazil is going to be able to effectively prevent a lot of that from happening uh, for some of the reasons that Ana pointed out but just uh, as well, logistical ones. In addition, a lot of these local interests are embedded deeply in local politics. Um, and so you're, you know, you're probably gonna be pushing these, these local parties even further towards you know, support of Bolsonaro or support of other uh, visions for what the Amazon should look like. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. I think uh, Mike will, Come back to you now, and and uh, you can tell us what some of the listeners and viewers have on their minds, and uh, take it from there. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, I think it's been a bit of a sobering kind of discussion, uh, really, as we've as we've gone along. Um, but we, we'll come to some raise raise some of the other issues in a moment. But Sophia Esterman says, "What is the way out of the extreme polarization we see?" also in Brazil's politics. What do we need to do? Or is already is it already happening? So in four years, we're not in not again discussing Lula times Bolsonaro or whoever the far right substitutes are at that point. I we seem to be talking about these things now. But are we still going to be talking about them in four years' time? And if we are, if we think we are, what are we going to do about it? Ishan, have a go at that. Well, if I, if I had you know, a... This is a Washington Post issue. I, yeah, come on. <laughs> let's, have, let's, have, let, let's have a Washington Post. Well, if I had a clear answer for... Uh... How we how we navigate out of polarization? I probably wouldn't be a journalist. Uh, I'd be doing something else. Um, but You'd be a uh, rich man. Yeah. Um, look, I think when we when we ask this question about polarization, sometimes it 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 sort of it, it's far too bilious and vague a term. Sometimes I think what we're talking about more often than not is the advent of an anti-establishment extremist, perhaps in many cases far right set of politics that is in some ways antithetical to how, uh, or creates conditions that are antithetical to how a healthy liberal democracy should work. And I think many societies are reckoning with the advent of these kinds of politics. Uh, I think uh, a lot of people are trying to wrap their heads around what brought us here still. And that is any number of the issues and developments in the global economy, uh, questions of, uh, <clears throat> you know, of, of failures to address inequities in various societies, failures to, to make large constituencies feel like they have a stake in the progress of their nation. Um, and that, of course, has to also come alongside uh, a question of how we handle the information space. And, and I think, um, you know, institute, there are certain blunt institutional responses that we're seeing, say, in Brazil and some other countries. But that in and of itself creates a certain backlash that creates narratives of marginalization, of left-wing tyranny or whatever you may, you may want to call it. Uh, and so I think we are faced with a much tougher conversation in many democratic societies over what it means to be a citizen, over what it means to be engaged in societies that need a kind of civic Republican, and I say that with a lowercase r, renewal in some sense, you know, what is it that binds us together? What kind of world do we want to live in together? And these are conversations that have to happen, you know, 
not in a political context, but in a kind of societal context. And, yeah, yeah. and we're not really near that. And we're not really near a situation where even certain governmental efforts to, to create news literacy, which I think are essential, people need to understand uh, what, you know, they need to know how to sift through the information that they receive. Yeah. Even those efforts are seen as, you know, are being seen as political. So uh, I, I don't, I, I really wish I could tell you where we go, but I think uh, it begins with recognizing and perhaps building new national narratives in various societies. Yeah, that's a really great answer. Nick, Nick I saw you nodding there. Would you like to come in on this one? Polarization. I felt bad for Ishan trying to trying to solve our polarization problems. I, I don't have answers uh, to polarization either. I think Ishan's uh, interjection about the this you know virtual social media space and the tendencies for polarization that exist there are is some of it for sure. Um, you know, at least in the United States, polarization, at least along the political parties, has been happening for quite some time incrementally. Um, and only, you know, maybe more recently have we gotten to this sort of culture wars situation, but the polarization of the parties has been happening uh, for quite some time. In Brazil, it's a little bit more difficult to tell because you have so many political parties, you know, around 30 uh, every election and politicians are jumping, jumping back and forth across these parties quite a bit, new ones are being created. Um, so it's a little bit more difficult to tell, but I I think a lot of the same dynamics that Brazil is suffering from in terms of polarization are the same ones that exist in the United States. I think economic inequality plays into this to a huge degree. Yeah, yeah. Uh, access to, to the state itself, belief in the functioning of government to actually provide things that they are listening to the to the population. These all have to do with it, in addition to these, these more virtual or social media spaces. Yeah. Very interesting. I know. I just wonder. Just taking this, still this, this on uh, a little bit further. What nobody has mentioned uh, the church in all of this, and the Catholic mm. Church in particular. To to what extent uh, does the church have any influence on either of the uh, of of the leaders? The one going out, the one the one is out, and the one who's who's come in, or on society is a. Is the Catholic Church struggling as it is certainly in, in Europe and uh, and other parts of the world? Anna? Um, yeah, so I think religion is, is a hugely important factor in Brazil and you know, both politically, socially. Um, I think, uh, you know, for me, the most important kind of uh, group here in kind of any religion uh, discussion in Brazil is the evangelicals because this is a group um, that is growing. Um, it has incredible influence politically as well uh, in terms of, you know, being able to elect um, representatives that kind of mirror some of, of uh, their demands politically, which, you know, usually have revolve around kind of a, a more conservative, socially conservative agenda, um, which is kind of, uh, you know, mostly around abortion, um, education in schools, so for, you know, gender ident identification and so on. Um, and, you know, there's, there's some fascinating studies that kind of uh, point to the fact that in, in about a decade or a decade and a half, um, evangelicals will probably represent about half of Brazilian society. And so I think, you know, it's important to kind of consider what does that mean um, in terms of the left's ability to govern and appeal to that half that is more socially conservative, that has different demands and, you know, wants as uh, you know, in terms of what they see in a political party that they want to support. And how do you bridge the divide between, you know, a more kind of progressive liberal voter who wants to see um, kind of, you know, progress on, on these issues like abortion and gay rights and LGBTQ um, education in schools and, and so on. And this, this other part of the population that you know, this is exactly what they don't want to see. Uh, so I think, you know, the right um, and the left, you know, in kind of going forward, we'll have to consider how do you, how do you bridge those, you know, ideological divides 
and reduce po uh, polarization, given the fact that, you know, there's just so such fundamentally different visions of what, you know, the ideal future Brazil looks like to these people. Andrea, would you like to come in on this? Is, what's, what's your experience of it in relation uh, particularly to, you know, to the Catholic Church, because Brazil is always, um, you know, for, since I was a boy, was known as, as, a, as a Catholic con country, like France was known as a Catholic country, which, uh, which has been kind of broken up now, that, that, that kind of categorization. But the, church, but the Catholic Church itself, I think, is split between a conservative fundamentalist kind of view and the, and the, and the greater liberalization view that we have with the, the present South American uh, Pope. You know, so I just wonder how that how you see that as reflected, Andres, in uh, in in your experience. Um, coming putting together the issue of polarization and the influence of religion in Brazil, this reminded me right now as Anna was speaking of the very beginning of Lula's administration, the Zero Hunger Program, which preceded the Family Grant Program. And the biggest challenge then was to find the extreme poor in Brazil. And they were undocumented, they were um, in, in cities of difficult access. So it took years for like at least one, more than one year for Lula's administration to kickstart its main policy and end uh, or you know, beat hunger in Brazil. And they did that by finding the social leaders of Brazil. So reaching to the priests and the pastors and you know the the baker um, in communities to really find out oh is this person still alive is why is this person documented and now I think these religious leaders they have a key role in Brazilian society and it's very proved they have misinformed people and some of them also have this role to to perhaps um, you know to to increase political awareness whether for the good or for the bad, we have seen the force of the church to enter politics. So reaching out to religious leaders or leaders in Brazilian society in general is not something that wasn't done before. And, and perhaps this is something that could, like, you know, the, 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 the very same threat could be also the cure. Like if, you, if we find these religious leaders and if we work with them, could we then deliver? Because the problem of polarization in societies, they're very hard to reach the other side. At the very best, we speak to the, the people in the same side of you, but a little bit in the end of the spectrum. So the left speaking to the, to the middle, to the center, uh, it's the maximum that can happen. It's very difficult to reach the far right. But maybe speaking to some of these leaders, would be possible, and we have seen some evangelical leaders approaching already uh, Lula's administration, at least uh, pastors from the biggest uh, evangelical Pentecostal uh, church. We know that evangelicals are very fragmented and, and very diffuse. So, so perhaps this could be a way um, to, to start the dialogue with a very, you know, fractured, um, society. And in terms of the Catholic Church, this would be perhaps even easier because it's a less fragmented structure. There are more uh, clear leaders and, uh, and, a, and a, a, a more unified um, um, way of working, which is extremely different from what we see in, in, in Pentecostal Church, which each adopt uh, a different model and it's even very difficult to find the leaders or their address and so on. But uh, but I think there is a lot of uh, work to be done um, to with religious leaders. And I don't think we should only look at the problems they brought, but perhaps what else can we do with this political force and, and which good can come out of it? Yes, I see Nick uh, nodding there. Do you want to say anything about this, Nick? Um, well, my experience in, in Rio's favelas, these are, these are communities with a, a huge evangelical movement. And as Andresa was rightly pointing out, it's a very fragmented space. There's, in some of the communities that I work in, there's dozens, if not hundreds of these small churches 
that are emerging within these communities to serve these populations, um, each with their own set of politics or their vision of society. So it's, a, it's um, I mean, it's a, an extremely vibrant area of political movement that I think has, has been occurring not just recently, this has been happening for the last 50 years or, or more, um, but they are um, very active in, in the public space, have become much more active politically in, in recent years, especially. Some high-level church leaders have even become mayors or governors uh, of Brazilian states. And um, you know, my experience with a lot of these people in these communities is that these, these churches are fundamental um, to building community in a way that they, they don't feel like they, they had community previously. Um, so they've been filling this sort of space of, you know, providing these places where they could go and build larger communities that a lot of Brazilians, at least in the favelas that I work in, have very much been been wanting. And at least in that period, especially after redemocratization, we're, we're demanding. Yeah, that's a... Uh... It gets more and more complex, the, the kind of questions that we go through, because Catherine Julian just turns the question in a different way. Uh, and this must come to you, Ishan, this one, uh, because Kathleen says, do you think journalists will be considered allies of Lula's government the way they were considered enemies of Bolsonaro's administration? I, I would definitely defer to Anna on that, but I mean, I would just say that uh, this whole phenomenon of, of journalists being perceived, obviously there's a long history in many countries of journalists being cast as uh, accomplices of this or that set of politics. But um, uh, look, you know, especially in the Trump era uh, here in Washington, we were told that we were the enemy, enemy of the people. We were uh, cast as, as, you know, agents of certain agendas and ideological projects. Uh, and what's striking to me, of course, I'm a columnist, so I, I, I write with a bit more argument and opinion than my colleagues, but if you look at the average reporter, the average reporter, especially at a newspaper, is perhaps the least ideological person you'll ever meet, uh, and, uh, and you know, certainly more so than the average citizen. Uh, so I, I find this whole line of always assuming what the, a journalist's political proclivities are uh, quite uh, condescending and often misplaced, misguided. Anna. I have to say I agree with that, Ishan. Yeah, Anna, what do you feel? Yeah, so I mean, that's an interesting question because I, I think it, it's still very early days, but we are seeing more openness in terms of access to information, definitely, um, because, you know, we did uh, just go through four years where many you know freedom of information requests were just stonewalled and you know went nowhere um so i do think you know there's uh there are signs of more dialogue and more transparency um at the same time i i don't know if um you know in kind of in the general population uh among people who are supporters of, of bolsonaro we've kind of being the enemy for a long time and i don't see that changing if anything there is you know this perceived uh, collusion between the press and lula so uh, you know i don't know if it might make our job a little bit easier in terms of coverage of uh, policy but i'm not sure you know basically every day reporting you know going out to um whenever there were protests like pro Bolsonaro protests or, you know, the, the camps in front of the military headquarters was kind of a battle just to to get access to um, have a dialogue with these people uh, that are kind of, you know, very firmly, um, you know, set in their belief that, you know, the, the press is not honest, it's not to be trusted, it's on Lula's side. So I think that continues, um, you know, to be a, a challenge going forward. Thank you for that. So Grady Humphrey asks, this is a tough one really, what are some of the potential economic alternates that could be effective in replacing the illegal uses in the Amazon? Go back to the environmental issue. What are some of the potential economic alternates 
that could be effective in replacing the illegal uses, uses in the Amazon. Nick, do you want to start with that one? Um, mm. Well, I'm not, I, you know, I don't do a lot of research in the Amazon. I know that there have been some initiatives recently at the international level to um, try to get corporations, large corporations that operate in those in those areas, to abide by some some like sustainability goals in in terms of like where all of their uh, products are coming from. Uh, you know, I'm I'm overseeing a, a dissertation project at the moment of a student who's interested in seeing how effective some of these mechanisms are um, for possibly reducing these connections between the illegal, um, you know, different actors in, in the Amazon and different types of corporations. But I think, uh, you know, the jury is still very much out on this. We don't know how effective they are. Uh, you know, I, again, as I'm not a, an expert in this area, I don't know the, the alternative economic models but maybe Anna, if she's spent more time there, could could illuminate us. Anna? Yeah, yeah, just to jump in on this, um, I've spent quite a lot of time reporting on the Amazon and, uh, you know, there are already initiatives that show a lot of promise. Um, you know, these include sometimes uh, extraction of uh, kind of essential oils and, you know, um, ingredients for cosmetics or, you know, I know I've heard a lot about kind of the, the potential promising uh, path in the direction of like pharmaceuticals, exploring the Amazon for, you know, potentially uh, natural ingredients that, that could be beneficial, um, you know, components of, of uh, you know, drugs and, and remedies, but, um, you know, and of course there's ecotourism and kind of exploring the Amazon in a, in a sustainable way without mm. cutting you know, cutting down trees. Um, the problem that we see, even in these kind of promising projects, is that at the moment they're very small scale most of the time and they require a lot of investment. Most of the time, you know, the anchor or kind of the, the building blocks for these projects tend to be NGOs. Um, you know, there's a lot of funds that go into constructing uh, some of these, you know, more sustainable economic models. And, you know, oftentimes when I report on something like this, which, you know, it's great to see these more, you know, these better alternatives. Um, but the question I'm often left with is how do you kind of scale that? Um, and how do you, you know, finance it, um, you know, in a different way and in, in the sense that it can stand on its own two feet without, you know, the need for NGO support for for years and years. Um, and yeah, mainly, how do you bring it to so many people in the Amazon uh, so it doesn't just remain kind of a, a small scale model um, and actually ends up improving the lives of, of, you know, a significant number of people. Andressa, do you want to add anything to that? Mm -hmm. I agree with my colleagues. I also must say that I'm not, um, and especially in Amazon, but we have seen a lot of um, discussion about green jobs and credit, uh, carbon credit. And um, above all, I think, I think we need to change the question a little bit. It's not about how to, to, to make alternatives to crime. Um, function and and to make activities that are as profitable. We also need to at some point, um, you know, punish environmental uh, degradation. And of course, we need to to create alternative jobs um, to the Amazon people. But it but it, we are not talking um, really about like the Hibirinos and the communities that live there and because they are not the ones making most of the profit and, um, and, and, and they don't necessarily pose a threat to, to the forest. What we are seeing is like incredible um, and, and not necessarily labor intense um, farms and, um, and mining and, and other activities that profit there. And I don't know if we need to create an alternative for some of these industries or um, they need to, to leave the area, as simple as that, and, and, and some sort of, so there, are, so there are different things going on at the same time. 
Good, thank you very much. Well, we're coming to uh, to the end. It seems to me that uh, we've been talking about democracy and, um, and the way democracy works. Uh, of course, it works on four pillars. Um, the uh, elected, elected government, the independence of the judiciary, the freedom of the press, and the autonomy of the university. And uh, it's those four uh, that keep it going. And at the moment, it seems, seems to me that we might be struggling in Brazil, but we're also struggling in the US and we're struggling certainly in, in my own country. Uh, and so I think that is what you've highlighted today for me anyway, is that we're all in this together. Although, you know, we could talk about, about the democracies and the, the mature democracies, but there's a lot going wrong with democracy that we've got to try and get right. I don't know if you agree with that, Sandy, or not. Well, I do, Mike, and I think, uh... I mean, we are passing through difficult times almost everywhere. But um, I, 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 as I said earlier, I think confidence in democracy is badly shaken in many parts of the world. And I don't know what the formula is to the polarization makes it much harder to restore that confidence. And I think, as you say, in the UK and the United States, this is this is true as well. You have a, a government in the UK that seems to have an unlimited mandate, doesn't have to go for an election, knows it's unpopular, and it, it seems to uh, be able to go on and on regardless. So uh, these are big problems, and that's why we have this series on on uh, democracy endangered. Maybe we'll only do a few this time and come back to it later. Our next one, by the way, will be on Israel and some of the fundamental changes to Israeli democracy that have been proposed and extraordinary scene of 100,000 people in the streets on any given day protesting those changes of the new, newly elected, duly constituted, theoretically democratic government. So uh, that's our next one in April, and uh, we hope people will come back and join us. I want to thank everyone for participating today. We had a a very erudite panel, and we're appreciative of your being willing to stretch yourselves to cover some of these questions. And uh, also, uh, as usual, support that we get from various institutions in Oxford and here at Georgetown University is extraordinary. We appreciate that very much. And I should not fail to mention the Knight Foundation. Uh, which was the founding supporter of the Free Speech Project at Georgetown and has given us a new grant to do regional symposia, which I hope our listeners and followers will start to watch out for around the country in cities where there are Knight Foundation offices. So, Mike, thanks to you for your partnership as well. And uh, over to you to close us out. Well, yeah, thank you. Uh, I think it's been, a, uh, as, as I said, it's been a sobering, uh, a sobering discussion. But you know, of those uh, those four pillars, um, we've had the freedom of the press here today, and we've had the autonomy of the university. Uh, so uh, there's something going right in terms of uh, <laughs> in terms of the discussions that we've uh, that we've been having. So uh, thank you, Ishan, Anna, uh, Nick, Andresa. Thank you, Sandy, as ever. As you said, Sandy, the next uh, free speech at the crossroads international dialogues will be on. Wednesday, the 22nd of March, same time, when we will be discussing uh, endangered democracies in Israel. Uh, and that's, that's we've got a fascinating uh, group of people uh, uh, in, in line for that discussion. I'd also like to mention that on the 28th of February in the Bent and Beautiful World Literature Arts and Environment series, we've got a fascinating discussion going on there with the uh, Dr. Tally Chilson, um, uh, and she's going to be discussing parks and recreation, London's East End slum during the interwar years. What's fascinating for us from this area is that uh, what she's talking about is the rise, of course, of the Nazis in the uh, in the 1930s in London. Uh, the, the 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 position of the Jewish population in London and the conflict with the Christian or work with the Christian 
communities in London. And she just brought out some some books, Simon Blumenfeld's uh, books uh, on, on this issue, the novel he wrote uh, in 1938, and that's just come out now. So it's, uh, that'll be really interesting for uh, viewers for the free speech as well as for the literature one. Uh, thanks to uh, Jack DeJoya, uh, President of Georgetown, Tom Banchoff, uh, Vice President of Blackfriars, John O'Connor, uh, the Regent, Richard Finn, uh, the Director of the Las Casas um, Institute at Campion Hall, Nick Austin and Yinging our Campion Hall administrators. Our real thanks, and I, I know Sandy says it every time as well, our thanks to John McKay, who does a great great job behind the, behind the scenes and thanks also to Maggie Scott who uh, who helps us on on the on the UK side who happens to be my wife but she helps us on the UK side uh, thank you for all attending today and for your support of our various series um, I'm Professor Mike Scott fellow and senior dean at Blackfriars Hall Oxford you can follow me on Twitter at Mike Scott Prof until the next time Thank you and keep safe. Bye bye. Thanks, mate. Good night, everyone.